Welcome to Inquisitive, this show which discusses issues on how to make the best of our technology. This first part of eight, of eight episodes, General Kiboshi, Kenya's Chief of Defense Forces, is sharing tech leadership wisdom from his military, technology and leadership experience. In this episode, we get to know the General as a person. I'm Thomas Kaberi. Welcome, Buana Sidia. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Kaberi. So what, what does your typical day look like, General? My typical day. Uh, uh, the typical day, I think, uh, of the CDF is, 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 uh, is basically the typical day of a soldier. Uh, and, and I think this is born out of uh, the training that the soldier goes through, uh, including the junior most of the soldiers. Waking up very early, uh, four in the morning, uh, doing a bit of uh, a prayer because we are also very religious people uh, in the military mm -hmm. and uh, making sure that you're fit mm -hmm. getting into the gym early in the morning uh, doing a workout uh, for 30 45 minutes uh, and then have some coffee and get get to the office uh, i live about uh, 15 minutes away from here mm -hmm. uh, so i'm in the office at around quarter to seven uh, and obviously the day starts with a lot of activities, uh, getting to uh, get to understand the situational awareness. A situational awareness in the military looks at uh, what is going on uh, in the security uh, dimension, in the theatres that we are currently in, uh, in Somalia. Uh, you are aware that we are all over the country, uh, so we get to get that situation. Uh, through briefs uh, and updates. And obviously, uh, from then on, I also do my own uh, reporting. Uh, I have to give a situation report to my boss uh, before we start at 8 with the routine uh, activities. Uh, certainly, there will be a number of engagements uh, internally uh, with the senior leaders here. I have uh, uh, about, I've got my vice chief, who is a lieutenant general, uh, who we have to meet in the morning. Then I've got uh, four generals, major generals, dealing with operations, uh, dealing with intelligence, uh, dealing with uh, logistics and personnel matters, and then dealing with medical, medical, medical matters. So I engage with those, uh, uh, those key staff. Uh, uh, and then later on, obviously, I have a chance to uh, meet up with the with the cabinet secretary, uh, you must be aware that uh, our cabinet secretary uh, is a renowned diplomat uh, and highly experienced in this field of uh, security, uh, Ambassador Monica Juma. So we engage uh, on those on those lines, uh, and obviously um, there will be at times where uh, there will be a lot of engagements with the. Uh, with external actors, uh, ministries, and all these kind of things. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's normally a big day. It's, it's a busy day. Yeah. Okay, so what, what time do you normally close your day? I get out of this office uh, probably at around uh, not later than 6 p.m. Uh, rather, not earlier than 6 p.m. Uh, and uh, uh, at times you can stay late, uh, depending on the volume, uh, on the volume of, of, of work. Uh, my day also sometimes will take me to um, outside uh, the office. Uh, there's a lot of field uh, engagements. Mm -hmm. I just came back from uh, two days uh, engagement with the troops in Isiolo and uh, Laikipia counties, uh, Monday, th uh, Tuesday last week. So again, uh, there will be a lot of uh, issues uh, that uh, will require uh, I get out of uh, this office. Uh, so it's always a nice, busy, rewarding day. Okay, great. Yeah, we'd also like to know what, so when you're not working, yeah. what, what are your hobbies, or what are your interests outside the office? What are the other things that you do? To well, uh, I have, I have, as I said, I, 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 I am, uh, uh, I believe in, uh, in fitness. Uh, if you get to my office, you'll see a plaque. I don't know whether they showed you that says they respect uh, fit people. 
uh, because it is fitness that gives you the drive to, to move this job. Uh, I obviously uh, have an opportunity to also uh, spend a weekend with my grandson. Uh, I'm a grandfather, uh, so I have a chance of engaging with uh, my grandson. If I'm not very busy, I head out to, uh, to look at uh, my, my cows. Mm -hmm. uh, I also take a very uh, passionate uh, view that you must be a an all-rounded person. Mm -hmm. You must be able to also look at life from a different perspective. Uh, the issue is that uh, at some point in time, once you get out of this job, you will need to do something that is productive uh, to the country. Uh, so I do a bit of uh, looking at uh, some sheep, some goats, some cows, mm. some chicken, you know, that kind of thing. Okay. Yeah. Any sports? Sports, I said, I, I do a lot of workouts. Uh, I go for a run. Uh, I take my team. Uh, last weekend, I took them out uh, uh, to, for, a, for, for a run. Uh, I normally take them out for a marathon, sometimes at the, at the Lewa. Uh, I take them for the, for the first ladies' marathon in Nairobi here, mm -hmm. uh, Standard Chartered. Uh, so those are my kind of uh, sports. Okay, let's, let's get a little bit into the office of the CDF. Uh, you can tell a little, uh, us a little bit more uh, about the role and the function of the CDF in our society and how this role has evolved over the years. The, the office of the CDF is, uh, is a constitutional office. Um, and this office, as you know, uh, the CDF office, as we know it today, uh, was a creation of the 2010 Constitution. Uh, previously, uh, from 1966, uh, we had uh, the assistant, uh, we had the, 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 the Chief of General Staff mm -hmm. Office, and uh, I'm currently the 10th uh, occupant of this office, uh, the first occupant having been a British uh, general called Penford, mm -hmm. uh, who obviously took over uh, in 1966 after independence. And then we had uh, the various other leaders, General Ndolo, Mulinge, uh, subsequently Mohammed, you know, uh, General Tonje, all the way up to uh, me taking over from General Madede. So the office of the CDF uh, is, uh, is, a, is, a, is, a very, is a very critical office to the extent that uh, one of the uniqueness of the military is the the technique uh, called the chain of command. Mm -hmm. Chain of command to the extent that uh, the leadership starts from the lowest level. Lowest level meaning where you have a corporal uh, who is responsible uh, for some 12, uh, 12 members uh, of the KDF uh, and then heading up the chain sergeant all the way uh, to the service commander. Uh, so the service commanders, the three of them, uh, Army, Air Force and Navy, uh, are directly answerable to the Chief of the Defense Forces, who himself, myself, am answerable to the Commander-in-Chief, and who is the, is, who is the, who is the President uh, of the Republic. Uh, so the office then becomes a critical pillar in uh, superintending over uh, the three services, they are independent in their management of their services, uh, but uh, the supervisory role uh, of those offices is placed under the office of the CDF. Uh, and, 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 and that is critical to the extent that uh, the military operates in a, in a joint uh, environment. Uh, the cumulative effects uh, of delivering uh, defense and security to the Kenyan people, uh, which is the responsibility of the CDF, uh, is the, uh, the, 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 the sum total of what the Air Force does, what the Army does, and what the, the Navy does. So that is, that is very critical. The office of the CDF also constitutionally is the uh, office that provides military advice, uh, defense advice uh, to the National Security Council, and obviously, uh, to the president who is the chair of the National Security Council. So any advice uh, that uh, is of military nature, the principal advisor 
is the CDF. Uh, so uh, to a large extent, therefore, uh, the institution of the military being one of the key uh, institutions within the instruments of national power, uh, you know, together with economy, politics, political and, and diplomacy. So the CDF occupies a very critical part there in terms of military uh, advice uh, to uh, the national leadership. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so w and that's 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 quite some insight that the CDF is uh, is the is the main link is the chief principal advisor on security issues to to the CIC. Not on the security issues, on defence. Because I think it's important to also contextualize uh, that um, security, as we know it, is a, is a very broad uh, terminology. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and national security uh, is, is just not defense. Mm -hmm. uh, it is uh, a whole range of other activities. Mm -hmm. We have the uh, interior mm -hmm. uh, ministry that mm -hmm. deals with security. We have the intelligence sector that also deals with security-related matters. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, uh, within the security sector uh, in the country, we have these key institutions, uh, intelligence, uh, internal security, and national defense. So cumulatively, we, we have a security sector. But there's a defense, there's intelligence, mm -hmm. and there's internal security. Uh, so, so, so when we look at security, then we are looking at, uh, and that's why we talk about the multi-agency multi approach uh, to security. In the sense that you cannot be able to deliver security unless you work together uh, in unison, mm -hmm. the, three, the three key actors. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much for that clarification. It is an important one. Yeah. So. Uh, in terms of the perspective of the civilian, what, what is the relationship and what can Kenyans expect of the defense forces? And, uh, and what can even our neighbors and our allies expect uh, even of the new CDF? Yes. Um, I, 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 I think from um, the Kenyans, Kenyans' expectation, Kenyans must expect uh, nothing less but comprehensive cover uh, by the Kenya Defense Forces. Because that is why they pay taxes. Uh, and therefore, uh, the return of investment that they must give, uh, that we must give to them, is comprehensive security cover from a defense perspective. And uh, I can assure you that uh, that is what uh, I, uh, as the CDF, uh, during my tenure, will ensure that the Kenyans get comprehensive defense, which means that we will be able to undertake uh, tasks uh, as mandated by the Constitution, first of protecting our sovereignty as a country and territory integrity, uh, in the sense that we protect our borders uh, to the highest level possible. Secondly, uh, within that mandate is that we are supposed to to cooperate and assist other agencies within the country uh, in matters of emergency or a disaster. Uh, and that we have uh, undertaken to, uh, to provide. Uh, as you are aware, currently, we are undertaking a lot of activities assisting uh, the Kenya Railways, for example, in recovering the railway line uh, from Nairobi to Nanyuki, which has already been completed. Uh, we are now engaged uh, in the Nanyu in Akuru uh, Kisumu uh, uh, line, and uh, soon we'll be going to the Gilgil uh, Yahururu uh, line. Uh, we, we, we therefore have a huge responsibility. The Navy has been very critically involved in providing support uh, to the Kisumu port, particularly reviving the ships there that have been uh, out of order for a long time. The Air Force has been critically important in providing support during national disasters, uh, transportation uh, of goods and services across the country. So basically for us, the Kenyans must uh, 
uh, their, 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 their anticipation uh, and expectation is that they will be fully covered by the Kenya Defence Forces. Yeah. Not that party, but comprehensively. <laughs> thank you, thank you. That, that's, that's quite comforting, sir. So let's, let's get into your career path. Yeah, we'd like to know uh, how, how you joined the army and uh, why you joined the army and uh, the various trainings and right. deployments that you have, uh, that you, that you have uh, uh, engaged in throughout your career. Right. Yeah, and so you, 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 can, you can just tell us when did you join the army and how and why did you join the army and mm. what kind of, uh, mm. of, uh, of uh, deployments mm. and trainings have you had so far? Mm. Uh, thank you very much. I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll need to be very brief here because uh, I've been around for 40 years. Yes. And the story of 40 years can take us the, the whole day. I don't want us to be here for the whole day. <laughs> but uh, keeping it simple, I, I, joined, I joined the Army uh, in 1979. Uh, at the time, I was uh, a student at uh, Nyeri High School. Uh, I had uh, attended my O-levels at a school called Kuelel High School, which is located inside one of our barracks, the 5th uh, Kenya Rifles. I don't know whether you know Gilgil very well. Yes. Now, I uh, got to be admitted to Nyeri High School. I was a st science student all through. Uh, I used to do maths, uh, physics, and chemistry was, was, uh, were my strength. While at Nyeri High School, I, I decided to, to take off and go and join the Army. I had been uh, passionately uh, engaged uh, with seeing this, the, the officers uh, in, uh, in that particular environment. Uh, and, and I think my desire was always to become like them. Uh, some of them had actually been uh, students uh, in, the, in, the, in the secondary school, and therefore they used to come uh, to talk to us uh, uh, during their free time. And we, 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 we actually, not just myself, a, a number of uh, uh, students from that institution actually did join. Uh, and most of them uh, ended up becoming very senior uh, leaders in the military. Uh, close to over 30 uh, of them uh, I know who joined. So that was the influence. Uh, that was the influence uh, uh, of, our, of our joining, the environment that we, we grew in. Now, having done my training, I, I wanted to join the Air Force. Um, and I actually did go for the interviews and everything. But unfortunately, uh, the later on said, no, uh, I think you will fit better in a, in a telecommunication environment. So I got myself to uh, Kahawa. Uh, and it was uh, probably uh, a blessing in disguise. Uh, I would probably not be here. Because even if I was going to become uh, the Air Force commander, probably I would just have become a major general. Now, I ended up uh, engaging in engineering training. Uh, started off training uh, as an engineer in the UK in 1981, 82. Uh, and then I was lucky and fortunate to get a scholarship to study uh, a degree uh, program uh, in India. Uh, for about uh, four years. Um, uh, so I rose through the rank uh, within the Cygnus Corps, uh, and uh, along the ranks, meaning that uh, commanding the various uh, uh, platoons and uh, uh, squadrons up to the level of the Corps commander. So I ended up commanding the Corps of Cygnus. And one of the most important thing in uh, the military is being able, particularly in the army, is being able to command your corps. Because there are very many arms here. Uh, there is a corps of uh, engineers, military engineers, uh, civil engineers. There's a corps of signals. There's a corps of uh, medical, uh, you know. Uh, there's the infantry uh, corps. So commanding your corps is a critical component. So I commanded my corps. And later on, obviously, I proceeded to uh, do my uh, National Defense College uh, here. Uh, having done my staff college uh, in the UK, 
uh, I did my, my National Defense College. And uh, at the National Defense College, I, um, I, 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 I got interested in doing uh, a master's in international studies, uh, uh, an area that I thought was a critical area in studying the, uh, the environment of uh, security in the continent. Uh, I'm currently working on my PhD on uh, collective security uh, in the Eastern African region uh, and looking at IGAD, uh, East African community, and the East African standby force. So I therefore have had an opportunity to undertake uh, quite a number of uh, trainings uh, across the spectrum uh, because one of the requirements in the military is that uh, for you to get uh, uh, to advance to the next level, you have to do various uh, courses. You just don't get promoted. You have to have had a lot of, uh, you know, uh, training. Uh, then, uh, obviously, uh, along the line, uh, I have served in this headquarters uh, in the staff level uh, from a lieutenant colonel. Uh, I was in charge of communication here when uh, General Tonje was the CDF, uh, CGS then. Uh, so I became his principal uh, communication advisor uh, then as a lieutenant colonel. It was a small uh, headquarter at the time. And then later on, obviously, I became uh, the head of um, the branch here in the strategic uh, planning and policy. Uh, and uh, later, I became the assistant chief uh, of the Defense Forces in charge of operations, uh, plans, doctrine, and training, uh, then working for General Karangi, who was uh, the CDF. I later, obviously, uh, as you may know, I became the Army Commander uh, and uh, the Vice Chief of Defense Forces, and this. So I've been through these ranks. So deployments uh, have been many. I've deployed as uh, as a, as, a, as, a, as a peacekeeper in, the, uh, in Sierra Leone, uh, where uh, Kenya participated immensely uh, in securing peace uh, in that country. Uh, I have had an opportunity to become the, the chief of staff uh, of the Eastern Africa Standby Force, in fact, the first chief of staff at the time, uh, and establishing that organization to the level now currently it is. Uh, uh, is, is something that we are uh, we are very proud of uh, as, 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 as a country. Yeah. yeah, very, very remarkable, very remarkable. Yeah, so uh, 40 years is quite... Uh, uh, it's a long time. It's, it's, it's a long time. It's yeah. quite, it's no mean feat. Uh -huh. And uh, we are sure there will be very many uh, emerging leaders within the security and defense uh, sector. There will be very many soldiers who will be watching this. Yes. would like to have an idea of what it was like when you joined the army versus what it is like to do today. How, what are the, would, would you point out as the key difference of what, what it was like then versus what it is like yes, no. now? Yes. I, I think there is, uh, there is a remarkable difference. Uh, when we joined, particularly for us, uh, of our generation, yes. uh, you will imagine that uh, for us we joined uh, having come from the villages. We are, uh, we are the generations that uh, actually uh, went through the hard, the hard way of, uh, you know, of, 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 of growing up. Yes. Uh, and therefore I think uh, to a large extent uh, that had uh, a lot of influence in, in the manner that we fitted into, uh, into the Defense Forces. Because mm -hmm. I think one of the key uh, determining factor uh, for you to succeed uh, in the Defense Forces is, is being displayed. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I, I, and I tend to think that uh, our upbringing at the time uh, was uh, that discipline was critical, even in schools. Mm -hmm. I remember in high school, uh, we used to have uh, uh, the principal uh, caning us if you went uh, off the rails. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't do that now, can you? Uh, and therefore, uh, joining then, you joined as a disciplined uh, cadre. Uh, and, and that helped a lot in fitting in within the military institution. Today, I think... Uh, there is a difference in the sense that um, 
those that are joining uh, the military uh, are our children. Uh, they have been brought up uh, by uh, middle-income uh, parents uh, who have the means uh, to a large extent. Uh, and therefore, the manner that we train them is certainly going to be different than the way we were, we were trained. But having said that, it has been easy for us to adapt. Uh, because again, as an institution, this is a very much uh, a learning institution. We have always tried to uh, redefine uh, our training doctrine uh, to be able to address the generational uh, changes and the generational gaps that, that, that exist. So there is much more to do here uh, because, for example, now we train our officers for three years uh, at the Kenya Military Academy. Uh, we used to train for one year. Uh, so there's a change there. There's also a change to the extent that uh, uh, most of the officers uh, and, and, and service members uh, have got higher education. Uh, most are joining after they have done uh, diplomas and uh, college degrees. Uh, officers now uh, have to get out of the training institution uh, at the Kenya Military Academy with a first degree. Uh, and therefore, uh, there has been a lot of change. Uh, there has been a lot of change uh, from the way it was then and now. Uh, is this change for the better? Absolutely. Absolutely, because uh, technology has also evolved over time to the extent that uh, the weapon systems that we are using today, whether you're talking about uh, a jet fighter, uh, you're talking about a warship, you're talking about a tank, uh, is all electronically controlled. And for you to be able to uh, operate this equipment, for you to be able to maintain this equipment, you require people with the requisite knowledge. So again, that, uh, that, that is the difference. Okay then, thank you. So uh, as, as, as we, we head to the close of this, we'd like to, to, to start uh, finding out what, what have been the major influences in your path? What has been, uh, what has been the major uh, ish, uh, influences of the person that you have become? Because for sure you have transcended uh, what was initially a very technical area to become uh, an overall leader of this institution. We'd like to know uh, what, what have been the major milestones in your career path and, uh, and what, what would be the major difference between that and, person, and a person who's pursuing a civilian career. Because sometimes we look at the, at, at, at the military and defense uh, professionals as sort of like a, a very closed uh, community. Mm -hmm. Would you help us to draw parallels mm -hmm. between what it is like to be uh, a civilian professional mm -hmm. and, and a military professional? I, I think there is uh, there's a sense that uh, the military ethics are underpinned by uh, three things. One, is loyalty to the nation. That a military uh, leader or military uh, person has to be loyal to the nation at the very first. Loyalty to the commander in chief, loyalty to the military institution, and loyalty to the unit that they, they serve under. That is critically important. The second part is the question of duty commitment to duty, I think, is, is, is a critical uh, pillar that uh, is ingrained in a military person right the time he gets into the training. The third one is a selfless service. Self, self, selfless service meaning that uh, putting the needs and the goals of the nation ahead of your, of your interest. And this is not that just theoretical. This is what happens in the military. When, you, when I go to Somalia, and I've just, uh, when I took over, I went back there, um, and you meet with the soldiers. We meet, you meet with the officers. It, it, it is an environment that is harsh, but the commitment that they have 
is, is something you cannot expect to get uh, from somebody else. We one time took, uh, I think you knew, uh, you know, uh, Sarah Serem. She was the chairperson of the Salaries and uh, Remuneration Commission. And as they were doing uh, job evaluation, we decided uh, when I was in the army uh, that uh, we will take her to see for herself and her team what the soldiers do uh, from when they wake up up to the time that they, they sleep. And it was clear that this is self, self, selfless service. They've put their, their, their needs, the needs of the nation and the goals of the nation ahead of their, their, their interests. And I think that, to me, is a difference. And, and that is also now uh, the culmination of uh, patriotism uh, that I think is critically important uh, uh, to an institution uh, that is considered the instrument of last resort. Because the military, surely, is the institution of last resort. Uh, if you get into any country where there are their, 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 their calamities, their disasters, the institution that comes to solve the problem last is the military, isn't it? Uh, and, 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 and therefore, uh, that institution must, have, must be patriotic to the nation, uh, must be loyal uh, to, to the leadership. Uh, and because ours, uh, our institution is subordinate uh, to the civilian authority, we therefore uh, have to support uh, the civilian authority uh, in, in all times of, 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 of challenges, disasters, and things like that. Oh, wow. That's, that's quite a, a, a unique set of, of, uh, of approaches to, to a career, yeah, where, where the interest of other people, the interest of the nation, come ahead of yours. Yeah, so what... What would you say then are, are the key challenges that uh, 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 a person who's been in the military for 40 years mm -hmm. uh, who, who has, has, has faced mm -hmm. in, in this career path? And what are some of your precious moments? What are some of the big <laughs> mo moments that you'd say these yeah. have been my biggest my, moments my, my, my in my career? Moments. Yes. I, I think uh, personally, when I look back uh, into my career, uh, and as I said, when I went for my peacekeeping mission, uh, I was a lieutenant colonel, uh, and I was the contingent commander then. And uh, my uh, greatest uh, moment is when this country called Sierra Leone, that had gone through a very severe civil war uh, environment, was able to stabilize and get back uh, into the community of nations. And, and today, uh, it is one of, you know, uh, the vibrant countries uh, in Sierra Leone. We meet with Sierra Leoneans, and they are very happy about what Kenya did there. Kenya was there for five years, and uh, they have had an opportunity uh, to come and serve with us in Somalia uh, because of what uh, the Kenyans gave. So I, I think that, to me, was my, my, my greatest moment, uh, where a country contributes to help uh, brother and nation uh, to the extent that they're able to get out of their problems and become a stable nation. My worst moment, I think uh, uh, we've had uh, bad moments. Uh, when I was the commander uh, of the army, I took the command uh, in 2016. And uh, we, we had uh, an incident where our troops were attacked uh, by the Al Shabaab uh, using vehicle bone uh, improvised explosive devices, two of them, uh, at a place called Colbio uh, in Somalia. Uh, and uh, it was a very uh, devastating moment. Uh, I, I went there uh, to the ground, I met with the troops. The troops fought hard, uh, absolutely. They fought hard uh, and they were able to maintain uh, their position. But obviously, uh, we had uh, casualties. Uh, and that, to me, was one of my lowest moments. Uh, because, as I said, I believe that the soldier is the most important 
component of defense force. He fights, he lives in, 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 the, in, the, in the bushes, uh, and therefore, uh, when one is hurt, just one of them, is a low moment. Uh, so that, that, that was my, uh, my, my lowest moment. But at least we've had better moments uh, uh, over time. And uh, I'll invite that uh, once we finish, we'll uh, provide you with uh, the, the, the soldier's legacy book. Uh, you'll be able to see the very bright moments that we've had uh, as an institution. Thank you very much. Uh, your, your passion for, for your soldiers is clearly evident, and, uh, and also your, 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 your sense of uh, commitment to the defense, uh, to providing defense and uh, providing your mission to this country, and even to this continent is very, is very evident in, in, your, in your speech. Uh, I would like to, to sort of like wrap up this conversation by capturing your vision and what your vision for KDF, your vision for our military institutions, and even your, for this country and this right. continent. Right. Yeah. My, my vision uh, as a CDF is uh, intertwined with the mission uh, of the KDF. Uh, the vision of the KDF uh, is uh, one that looks at KDF as a premier, uh, credible, and professional force. Uh, those three uh, pillars are critical. Premier uh, as the best uh, military force uh, that uh, this country must have because Kenyans deserve to have the best military to defend them uh, and to give assurance uh, that uh, the country will continue to exist uh, irrespective of what would happen outside the country. Secondly is credible, credibility. Credibility is critically important because for you to be credible, you have to have the capacity to, uh, to, 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 to deter uh, aggressors. You have to have uh, the posture that is critically important for you to communicate very clearly that you mean business. And that's exactly uh, what, what, what the vision of the KDF is. Secondly is professionalism. The Kenya Defense Forces, uh, uh, to a large extent, is the most professional force I know. Uh, we've trained with the very best. As I said, uh, I've had my training uh, with the British, the Indians, the Americans, uh, and, and, and all the officers, all the men here, have had an opportunity to train with other forces from our side. And, and we pride ourselves for that. And, and that is underpinned by our belief that we must continuously train. Because the security th environment evolves over time. It is always in flux. So if you don't engage yourself with training over time, training on new systems, training on new threats, how you counter new threats, you will be surprised. Uh, and therefore, that is critically important. So my vision uh, individually, therefore, is to look at how do I re-energize uh, the perspectives of our ability to be mission ready. Because if the threat is changing, on a very fast pace, you have to be able to be mission ready. Because today, we are dealing with the COVID-19. None uh, of us, uh, and even the major world uh, countries, knew that there was going to be this COVID. A and COVID is in itself a threat to national security. It is a health issue that has got Im implications on national security. And therefore, uh, as a defense then, what do we need to do? Because we have, a, as, as I said to you, we have a medical establishment. What do we need to do to prepare our medical uh, establishment to be able to uh, confront such kind of threats? 
it could be Ebola uh, next time. It could be, as you remember, we had uh, an opportunity to send our people to Liberia to help uh, during the uh, Ebola outbreak. And therefore, because the institution of the military has got all these professionals, how do we prepare them to be able to be uh, of assistance uh, to the country as required by the constitutional mandate in, in circumstances where we face uh, these kind of challenges? So these are lessons learned. And my view, therefore, is that we have to have our capacity to research within the medical profession. You talked about innovation. We must be able to innovate uh, in various dimensions. So I look at mission readiness as a key component. And that component is driven by the need for us to continuously train up, continuously equip the soldier with the necessary tools for them to be able to engage with the threats that are mutating, our ability to provide a proper health healthcare system to the soldier and their families, and our ability to be ready to help in national development, uh, which is, again is very important for the Kenyan people who are paying taxes. So, so that is my vision, a re-energized mission readiness for the Kenyan Defence Forces. Re-energized vision readiness for the Kenyan Defence Forces. That's quite a solid vision. And uh, we have come to the end of this first episode and uh, getting to know the uh, the Chief of uh, Kenya's Defence Forces, General Robert Kiboshi. And his journey, it's quite a tale of uh, persistence and excellence. And uh, there are some quite very interesting uh, facts to discover about the general. So join us in the next episode where we'll be looking at mili where we'll be discussing military leadership and how that can be uh, applied in the civilian uh, context. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.